You're listening to the Creep Peaks Podcast. Today's podcast is brought to you by Audible. Get a free audiobook download and 30-day free trial at audibletrial.com forward slash cheapgeek. Welcome to the Creep Peaks Podcast. This is episode number 120. Weird Wednesday, high strangeness in North Carolina, Andrews Geyser. That's right. It's a Weird Wednesday episode of the Creep Geeks Podcast. Something new we started just for you. That's right. <clears throat> we normally do our podcast and we have one episode a week, which people like to download and listen to at their leisure, which you can do with podcasts. It's part of what makes podcasts and great. We decided to start a different series and it sort of ties in with our YouTube channel. It's a series that we're going to do in addition to our normal podcast and also our in real life video series. We joined the paranormal investigation team, right? Mm -hmm. This is called Weird Wednesday. And so what's Weird Wednesday? Uh, We're going to focus on strange topics that may be uncommon or not very well explored. Yeah, primarily in our local area. So this ties into the high strangeness that is in North Carolina. So we moved from the Southwest back to North Carolina, and uh, there is some weird, weird stuff here. It's got its own flavor of weird. It definitely has its own flavor of weird, or high strangeness, because I always like that, high strangeness. So we're going to start it off with Andrew's Geyser. And ready? Okay. Here we go. So Andrew's Geyser is a geyser. It's a man-made geyser. It's actually located in Old Fort, North Carolina. Right? Yes. So this geyser was made in 1885, right? Mm Mm-hmm. So far, so good. See, and the reason why we have to be specific with the details is because there's some general cloudiness that accompanies these details that gives this whole geyser kind of a weird, weird flair. Yes. A weird sort of vibe about it. It's just strange. And some of the ties that the geyser is associated to are also strange. Yeah. So what we did today was go out there and take another look. We've been there several times. We we thought we would go out and take a, a better look at it. And we did. So we went out there and we took a better look, did some filmage, and we thought we'd come back and tie the audio podcast into the video that's going to be High Strangers in North Carolina, Andrews Geyser, number one. Okay. All right. So 1885, the geyser was made, right? Yes. So why is this geyser in existence? Who made it? Why did it actually... (laughs) What's its purpose? So, built in 1885, just outside Old Ford, North Carolina, this geyser marks the culmination of grand construction in this section of western North Carolina, as well as a celebration of the Southern Railway Company and those who passed while constructing constructing this segment of the railway. Okay. So, how many people passed? 120. Wow, that's a lot. Yeah, and then on top of that, the area allegedly has some Civil War ties, and a lot of Old Fort North Carolinians, as well as anybody in the Western North Carolina that was a part of the division for this area, right. a lot of those people passed too, and there's monuments for those people at this geyser. Okay, so this is to commemorate the people that died during the construction of the Southern Railway, mm-hmm. or the railway for the Southern Railway Company. Yes. And the Civil War. And. (laughs) And what else? And it's supposed to be the grand little centerpiece as train passengers go through this section of Western North Carolina. They're supposed to see the geyser as well as, well, it's no longer there. They're supposed to see the Grand Knob Hotel. Okay. You know. So this was the centerpiece to draw attention so that when the train stopped, they could stay at the hotel and also see this geyser. Yeah. Mm, okay. So far, so good. I guess. <laughs> now, the weirdness that starts when you kind of look at the shape of the general geyser, the, the general shape, I should say, of the geyser, it's okay. So, it's a man-made geyser. Yeah. Which means that they have a large body of water that feeds pipes. And as the pipes get closer to the geyser, they get smaller in diameter, thereby increasing the force of the water mm-hmm. until it gets to the nozzle where the geyser shoots up continually. Because of the force of the water traveling downhill through those narrowing di- narrowing diameter narrowing diameters of pipe, and it shoots straight up in the air, right? 
Yeah. That's neat. So that's the thing, though, because it. I'm looking at the original pictures of right. this geyser. Mm-hmm. They're nowhere near what we see today. Okay. <clears throat> and see, that's part of where the problem lies. Yes. The original geyser was moved to and its current location, right, which is about 70 yards away. Yes. On top of that, this geyser was huge. And the, the science that you just explained, you know, the whole buildup. Right. And Hydraulics, if you will. Yeah, almost. Yeah. Now, there is a dam as well as some other water, I believe, behind where the old the hotel used the to be. old knob. Yeah. Right. Where the hotel used to be. And that allowed, when that water came up through that pipe system, it allowed the man-made geyser to be so grand. And maybe in moving the location, it's just now, it's just a geyser. Yeah. You know? And so the, the geyser used to have much higher sort of in height. It's over the railway yeah. in this photo. And, and so that would be huge because now it's not. It's maybe 25, 30 feet tall at yeah. the most. And we think part of that has to do with it being moved. And it's also possible the original shape of the geyser um, in the fountain where the geyser is, the, the whole sort of base area was changed as well. Because it looks like originally it was a five-pointed star. Mm-hmm. Now it's more like a rounded five-pointed star, which is also kind of strange. And there's some influence there in the design that a lot of people will say came from a Masonic influence from, like, for example, the Freemasons. Hmm. And it's funny <clears throat> because depending on who you ask, some people will say, oh, yeah, it was made by the Masons. Like it's some kind of, you know, super secret, terrible thing. And other people say, yeah, it's made by the Freemasons. And they enjoy the Freemasons because it kind of goes back and forth depending on who you talk to, right? Yeah. And whether good or bad, that kind of thing. And at the time, uh, 1885 and through, you know, into the early 1900s, there was sort of a um, negative view of Masons, I guess. Like almost an anti-Mason movement. Yeah. So, <clears throat> and so. that actually, it extended for longer, but I, I guess it may have been in its height during that era. <clears throat> and... The hotel, the Round Knob Hotel, was kind of the focal point for, you know, okay, past the geyser, here's a nice hotel. And, oh, honey, let's stay at the hotel. We can watch the geysers, whatever. Yeah. The hotel, some for some reason, burned to the ground in 1903, which I probably, we should look into that as well. So when it burned down... It was probably a fire that did it. Well... (laughs) From what we know so far. Yes. (laughs) It's... Probably a fire to death. Thank you for your contribution. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. I'm over here (laughs) dying from pollen exposure. It's crazy. When the hotel burned down in 1903, the fountain eventually fell into complete disrepair. Yeah. So in 1911, someone named George Fisher Baker, who, and it's funny because in my research, it's just like this little quick blurb, a wealthy New York financier and philanthropist, who had been friends with Colonel Andrews. I should have mentioned this is named after Colonel Andrews. Right. Yeah. This George Fisher Baker funded the restoration of the the geyser. Now, at that time in 1911, the Southern Railway Company did not grant continuation of the easement for the fountain. So, a new five-sided basin was constructed about 70 yards across from Mill Creek, and the piping and the nozzle were also moved. So, is the original basin of the fountain a pointed star? Do we know? I'm. That's the one thing that I want to keep researching because I have a couple of pictures. Right. And one yeah. just shows this very, very <coughs> massive round circle. Okay. So, but the round circle also has something leading to a pavilion. Now, that pavilion... Who knows what was happening there? Okay. And you see how this looks completely different from what we see. Yeah, it looks totally different. This whole thing has sort of a rounded shape. Um, It's like in a bowl. Mm Mm-hmm. All right, so the fountain was moved and reconstructed about 70 yards away from its original location. And what made it kind of strange that we noticed was is that it does have a five sort of pointed star um, shape to the actual uh, fountain basin, right? But it's rounded, right? Yeah. So you have a rounded five-star fountain base. I don't know what you call a fountain base. It's, it's the it's the thing where all the water sits in where you throw like pennies and stuff. And this thing is huge. Okay? Pond? 
was Maybe. already a pawn, but um, and there's a couple other markers there too. There's a single chair facing the east. There's a bench um, of a higher elevation. So, you know, to some people that when we talk about Andrews Geyser and say, "Oh yeah, it was built by the Masons," or you know, something has some kind of weird meaning to it, or some sort of weird, you know, vibe or some to it. secret society, yeah, some you sort know? of secretive about the entire thing. Um, I can see where they would say that. And these, these items, the, the chair and the bench and the, uh, it looks like a, like a, also like a bench, like you, like a judge's bench, right? Yeah. Or made out of the natural stone that's there. Right? Mm-hmm. And there's, what? There's also remnants of other benches. Right. There's also rocks that are deliberate. They're not river rocks. These are rocks that are deliberate, deliberately placed in certain places. Right. Um, there's also a stone table that was towards the back. So these things are set up in a very specific way. Yeah. Some and, would say yeah. that the, the placement of certain stone structures kind of resembles the inner temple of a Masonic lodge. Hmm. You no. Know what I mean? Yeah. So that's kind of strange. So, and, and back then, and, and like with most masonry type stuff, from what our little minuscule understanding of the masons is, most masons don't identify themselves as being masons. Hmm. And back then, you know, the theory is, is that the working theory is, is that Vanderbilt was a mason, right? Yes. George Fisher Baker was a mason. Was he? Yep. Okay. And who else? Um, it might be possible that his friend, Colonel Andrew, Andrews. Colonel Andrews was a Mason. Yeah. And, and of course, there's supposed to be Masonic ties to the Southern Railway. Right? Yeah. The Southern Railway Company, I should say. So, who knows? Now, whether or not it's actually tied to Mason and Mason influence, uh, I can't say. I mean, if you look at it, there's some things that don't necessarily line up. Or would match what you would do, but at the same time, it looks like there may have been some kind of influence there. And maybe that influence has either been lost to the years, or there's some been some revision, because, yeah. like we said, you know, it, the the fountain area itself fell into disrepair in the nineteen hundred early nineteen hundreds, nineteen o three ish, and then again, someplace between, I want to say nineteen eleven and the nineteen seventies, it fell into disrepair again. Yeah. Now. Back in 1911, the guy I mentioned, George Fisher Baker, also known as the Dean of American Banking, um, he funded the redesign. Now, because of the railway company not not allowing the easement, I'm wondering if that allowed him to add certain touches to it. Oh, some embellishments. I'm sure yeah. if, he, if he had to move it, if he had to move it because the easement was lost. Yeah. Right, so he had no access to it, and he got to move it 70 yards away, and he funded the whole thing, you know, through however he acquired the funding. I'm yeah. sure he changed it. I mean, you know, I would think, because the difference between 1885 to the 19, what, 1916? 1911. 1911? Yeah. How many years is that? The 15, 20, 30? At least 20. Yeah. So. <laughs> so, I mean, 20 years later, maybe the design was different, and maybe that's where this rounded sort of five-star came about, instead of being a, a pointed five-star. And also, five star. that whole, I mean, if he wanted it to be rededicated to his friend, Colonel Andrews, maybe it was a dedication and kind of a, you know, tip of the hat to whatever Colonel Andrews was involved in. Yeah, that's you know? possible, too. But this this George Fisher Baker guy, once I found out who funded this place to get rebuilt... I started to look into him, and I'm like, oh, wow, this guy could almost be a podcast episode himself. Yeah. Because, I mean, he he's known as the Dean of American Banking. He has all these ties to all these people, like Rockefeller, Henry Ford, J.P. Morgan. Um, what about the Vanderbilts? That I can't really find. I'm still looking. Hmm. Now, I can say we could probably make a connection there because he was a member of the Jekyll Island Club, which is that... Ooh. Is that, that rich... Rich resort. Yeah, that rich people resort. Um, that's in a, Jekyll Island, down yeah, in Georgia. Allegedly haunted, and he did own property in Georgia. You know, it's funny that this sort of ties into the Jekyll Island Club and all that because when we were at the Bigfoot convention in Georgia, we actually talked to a girl, a young lady, who worked there along with her sister, and told us all about you know this this haunted sort of um, experience they would have at the Jekyll Island Club. Because they hmm. worked a resort. It's a resort now. So, 
That's kind of a little funny tie back. It's funny because, you know, the fountain is nice because it's a nice geyser, right? They call it a fountain, but it's really a geyser. It's got the geyser shooting up. It just seems out of place, you know? Yeah. And I think the original sort of geyser and where it was built in the fountain and the location was probably a much better thing to look at. More uh, majestic, if you will. Because now where it's shaped, it seems like it doesn't make sense. And they actually went through and rededicated this geyser in, when was it? 1976, right? Yeah. About three to four months before the bicentennial celebration. So why? And this was done by, you know, the city of Marion, right? Marion, or North Old Carolina. Fort. Old, yeah. I'm sorry. Yeah. Old Fort, North Carolina. Um, rededicated it in 1976, but they didn't do it at the bicentennial. It's a little odd. Yeah. The fountain shape itself is a little odd. The placement of the stone structures is a little little odd. It sort of vaguely remembers the inner temple of uh, Masonic Lodge, but can't say for sure. And I mean, who knows exactly anyway, mm-hmm. right? And so why is the current location on what they consider to be historic Civil War land? Which, if you are a historic Civil War researcher, you actually find out some of the battles were miles away. Yeah. You know? So are they saying it, it was just basically land that was used during the Civil War? Dude, wow, my computer got really loud. It scared me real bad. Real bad. So is it possible that, you know, just because they had troops maybe on that Civil War land, they're just calling it his, historic Civil War land? Or did Civil War so, Civil War soldiers help to try to make the railway and lost their lives, like the 120 See, that would make that sense. supposed to be devoted to? Yeah. So it's devoted to a guy named Andrews, right? 120 people have passed away that were help working on the railway, it's devoted to the Civil War. It's got this is like a, a whole bunch of multi purposes, right? Yeah. I mean, at least a dual purpose, and <laughs> what the fountain is for, the geyser is for. <clears throat> Even so, it's it's funny because when you're there, and you pointed this out to me, and I didn't pay much attention to it. There's a ton of trees that surround the geyser, yeah. that are all like dual trees. So, and that that was the part I wanted to kind of expound on because yeah. it's like. Every single place I started to research Andrew's geyser, it kept talking about dual purpose, dual this, it does this, but it's also this, it does this, and then this, you know? But then when you start researching secret societies and organizations, a lot of them focus on duality and the duality of man, his obligation to grow civilization, but also his obligation to the earth. Or, you know, there's various forms of duality. Right. But... Why was that in, like, every single article I go to research, and then we get there to Andrew's Geyser, and there's all those dual trees, or trees stemming from, you know, like, the same trunk. Yeah. Which is really, I mean, there's, you know, not just one or two. There's, like, 10, 15. If you start counting them, um, there is a bunch that actually surround this geyser. The scientific explanation of that would be, oh, well, because this area gets flooded trees root or take root in the strongest place they can so it it would make those trees pop up like that but not that many no that, these are dual trees growing it's almost like they were planted or made that way dual yeah because if you walk like half mile down it stops happening yeah there's also a possibility that it may be caused by something else which we'll talk about later on yeah so anyway and so what dragged us to this place, or, or basically drew us to the place, I shouldn't say drag, we've been back three different times, but what actually drawn us <laughs> to this place was, you know, the first time we went to go see it, because it's a, it's a local attraction, it's in Old Fort, North Carolina, it's not hard to get to, it's free, we like taking pictures, we do that sort of thing, that's part of what we do, we also like to do video, and plus I figured we got there and, and sort of, I had a, I had a, a video camera I'd like to, t- I wanted to test, and I went ahead and did a test, and if you follow us, at all and you've listened to any of our podcasts you also know that we have a a youtube channel for our creepy spots podcast but we also have one for cheap geek yeah we do product reviews diys how to's that kind of thing you know it's got twenty seven thousand subscribers and 11 million views all kind of thing and so i wanted to bring some um chinese action cameras what they call faux pros not necessarily a (laughs) gopro but a faux pro like fake gopro and sort of test out the camera so you're saying our outing had a dual purpose it did it totally did (laughs) And I figured since there was water there and you had never been there, that it would be a perfect place to go. I mean, the water I was thinking of was actually thinking of the little little river, Mm -hmm. like creek that runs by. So anyway, we went the first time and it felt a little strange. You know, sometimes you go somewhere and you 
you get to, you know, I don't want to necessarily say a bad feeling or heebie-jeebies, but, you know, you're kind of, like, on alert. Mm. It just felt kind of weird to me. So, and then, you know, we, we did, we found some amazing frogs and tadpoles and got to, you know, test the go, I'm sorry, faux pro, and it's waterproof housing and everything was great. Right? Mm-hmm. And then we decided to go back. Remember? Yeah. And we went back and I tested out another camera because we bought another camera because one of the goals that we have is to make little documentaries and little videos and things like that. And as we were leaving, we met this kid. Oh, well, back up just a tiny bit. I went hiking and let you explore with the cameras. And when I went hiking, I went to pretty much a crossroads of the railway and the creek. Yeah. At which point a train passed by and the ringing that occurred. Yeah. From there is on our Instagram, by the way, but it was so significant. Instead of the ringing f- echoing off and fading away, it just kept increasing and increasing to the point where I actually had to stick my fingers in Pepper's ears, our little Pepper's dog. Pepper's our dog, just in case. Because it was painful. Yeah, it had a high resonance for sure. And, and it just continually echoed. And as the train went past a certain point, because it had its brakes on for sure, yeah, it just continued. And it, it did sound like a Tibetan bowl. Yeah. Like a ringing bowl, you know. And if you look at the old picture that I, I showed you, yes. this place is a bowl. Yeah. The whole thing is a bowl. Yeah. It's kind of weird. <laughs> but so I found the, some weird pic- I found some weird art there, took some pictures, and right. as I was walking up, that's when I saw that kid. Yeah. Yeah. And so we were packing up to go, and... We met this kid, and I, I want to say 90, 99%, that's, well, that's probably a little, a little generous, 95% the kid's name was Joshua. Okay. Right. Yeah. And he told us about a couple of different things that started to explain some things. He told us about shadow people being seen in that area, which is oh. kind of strange. Um, he also told us that there is a, a Civil War cemetery in that area that's close to his property, Right. Huh. And he had seen shadow people there. He told us about weird things that would happen at the geyser area at night. Yeah, and but he didn't really expand too much on the weird things. He also said that a lot of people did not go to the geyser at night. Right? Mm-hmm. He talked about the feeling of being watched all the time at the geyser, which is funny because every time we've gone, I've felt like we've been watched. Um, he also talked about, aside from the shadow people and the possible visitors in the area he he talked about um well what did what are they called dryads yeah dryads. he he referred to them as dryads when we were talking to him yeah yeah so and a dryad is basically a an elemental spirit that i guess has the ability to manifest in some sort of near humanoid form yeah now dryads in traditional like european or greco-roman mythology they're they're kind of like sirens almost they yeah. lure people away um or there's the other ones they're just extremely elusive and don't want to be seen and they get very reactive if they're spotted yeah so he spoke of kind of his friends having experiences of seeing <clears throat> or encountering dryads while hiking out there yeah he also said he would hi- he knows that area and he would hike and find stuff that he didn't want to find and I didn't really understand. It. Maybe he had been talking to you about that. Yeah. Uh, he had seen some things, but he didn't necessarily expand too much. But, you know, the feeling is, is that you, know, you go to that particular place, you feel like you're being watched. You don't feel like you're being watched by like an animal necessarily. It's something sort of different, or maybe possibly otherworldly. And when you explore those mountain areas that you see all sorts of strange things. Now, the thing about this area is in general is that, you know, it has been known for having Sasquatch sightings along with little people and the occasional shadow person and things like that. When he brought up talking about the dryad slash, you know, almost like Reiki or rake yeah. um, spirit, which is known in these woods, you know, and I shouldn't say these woods in general, but on the Blue Ridge Parkway and all throughout North Carolina, there's the Cherokee talk about them too. That, you know, I kind of thought, okay, from listening to him talk, I'm like, well, you know, that's the local lore. You know, if you yeah. don't see Sasquatch or something like that, you, it's little people <laughs> or, or some kind of spirit, you know, forest spirit, that sort yeah. of thing, right? You know, so, because they have like a similar similar phenomenon. You see something weird in the woods, what is it, right? I mean, which is funny because <clears throat> it kind of has a dual purpose, right? Mm-hmm. It's like, what did you see? So, I heard this kid talk. We talked for quite a while um, and he told us about 
feeling like he was he felt like he was protected by one of these forest spirits. Huh. He just said he got the feeling that he was protected, so he had no fear cruising through these woods. I'm like, huh, okay. You know, me personally, I'm like, I don't want to necessarily go into these woods alone, you know, or in that particular area, because when you're in the geyser, there's a nice little parking spot. You're really not sort of in the middle of nowhere necessarily, you know. I mean, <clears throat> it is a clearing. Off, sure. <laughs> but if you walk off into the woods, it gets pretty steep, you know, if you, especially when you can't climb out of the bowl and get further up in the woods. So. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but he did talk about some of the experiences he had. And then so, you know, a couple of weeks later, looked it up and just sort of looked at Andrews Geyser and came across this article on phantoms and monsters. Huh. <clears throat> right? Yeah. And this is uh, Tuesday, May 2nd, 2017. So not that almost long a year. ago. Like it's almost a year to the day, right? Well, it's 2019. Yeah. 2019. <laughs> is it? Yeah, it is. Right? Yeah. Okay, it's so almost two years to the day. And the article says, or the, the posting is, Daily Two Cents, The Rake versus Rogue, Dryad, Ghost Girl or Not, House of Snakes Nightmare. Okay. Which sounds like an amazing podcast, right? <laughs> <laughs> so this is a letter, and it basically says that the Rake versus the Rogue Dryad. Dryad. And there's a lot, but I'll kind of kind of read it to you, right? It says, I've been following your, following your blog for a long time and appreciate your steadfast work. I, myself, am an inspiring member of the Paranormal Investigator and a big fan. And here's, I'm going to come in. I'm not going to read the entire thing because it's, it's relatively long, but we do have a link. Yeah. Okay. I dropped down to I live. Yeah. yeah. I live in the western part of North Carolina in the Blue Ridge Mountains near Asheville. Over the years, I've had a number of people visiting my neck of the woods describe rather frightening encounters with this uh, similar phenomenon. Right? And we've heard some of this too. The first of note was years back around 2008. A friend of my mind, a friend of mine was a practicing, uh, practicing medium, and he met with me at Andrews Geyser, which is a local monument known for its Civil War past and shadow people, right? Mm-hmm. And I've heard both of those things when you talk about Andrews Geyser. Yeah. You know, Civil War, shadow people. And she claims to have seen a very disturbing creature, a, jo- a gaunt, skinny, like, you know, really emaciated humanoid, with pale, deadly flesh, willowy limbs, black eyes, gaping maw that seemed to in, uh, animate pure fear, right? Yeah. And she was settled by, she was uh, very unsettled by the vision. So, when, and he told, and the funny thing is, is that when I was talking to this guy, he said the same thing. Yeah. So, putting two and two and five together, this is the same person. Okay. I mean, it's got to be. Because when I remember reading this, after you showed me this, I was like, that's the same person I talked to. <laughs> well, cause, because yeah. our conversation came back to me. Some of this I wasn't present for. So I was like, wait a second. Yeah. And, yeah. and I was because he, he started talking to me. I started listening. And I tried to get him to you know, send us an email with you know, the, the story. And if, you, if you're listening to the podcast, because he said he would listen, reach out to us. Because we'd like to do more thorough investigation. And having a local guide would be fantastical. Yeah. Especially if you're protected. <laughs> <laughs> I know, right? Yeah. <clears throat> but so, this goes on to say, you know. A few years later, right? Yeah. In 20, because uh, she was very unsettled by the vision. A few years later in 2011, right? Mm-hmm. My significant other at the time would talk about uh, a feeling of dread whenever she was alone in certain parts of the woods. And that she always had the feeling of being watched and unwelcome. Uh, funny, that's brought up because that's exactly how I felt yeah. today. Here's the watched th- and unwelcome. Occasionally seeing pale shapes dart in and out of the trees. That describes a lot. Yeah. Okay. I can't say 100% for sure that's what I was seeing, but I was seeing movement in the, the woods when we were out there, which is funny because we actually had a cryptid expert with us, Christian, from the Asheville uh, Cryptid Society, and to do an interview to talk about this particular place, right? Mm-hmm. And he felt the same way. He's like, man, I feel like somebody is watching us. I feel like something is watching us. And he said that multiple times, and I didn't say anything like that at all. I was just setting yeah. the equipment. So that was kind of weird. Because right? we kind of, and I hate to say this, we kind of held that information until we brought him there so he could get a read on the area because we didn't want to yeah. influence him too much. So... Yeah. Now, he also says, around the 28th of this year, which would be 2017, a close friend of mine was driving on a gravel road after visiting me and claims to have seen, crouching in the forest just off the road up on a small rise, a pale and terribly thin crouching figure. 
and the description that she gave was eerily similar to the account given by the medium, mm-hmm. the acquaintance that he had had years before, which made it even more eerie considering those people had never met, yet they described the same entity, and the connection, of course, is the woods and this guy. Mm-hmm. Well, I'm like 90% sure his name is Joshua, right? Yeah. So he said, uh, in his college days, he theorized with his friends, right, with his medium ally uh, had said, seen in 2008 and came up with an interesting hypothesis. This is what, because I, I thought this was interesting. And yeah. This is a hypothesis, what she actually seen. What other people have encountered and why they had never seen a thing or never felt unease or dread from those forests was this. The creature that, you know, bears many similarities to the rake of quasi-pop culture. I like that quasi, right? Is in fact a dryad gone bad. Hmm. The forest had been periodically clear-cut and burned by loggers and the railroad for decades upon decades at this point. So those natural spirits or tree spirits who survive this will inevitably go bad. Yeah. Or turn feral. And the reason that this person had never seen or felt the dreadful presence of this entity is because he had lived and grown up in that wood, in in that area in the woods. Yeah. Right? With the recovering forest since he was a child and this dryad that he's thinking that people are seeing has sort of adopted and claimed him, which would in turn would explain by why certain women would experience a sense of unwelcome. Which is little-known fact. <clears throat> Dryads are usually out there <clears throat> and are kind of pro-aggressive or immediately defensive against women. Yeah. So, yeah. Now, if the, he does theorize towards the end that these rake entities people seem to be experiencing are in fact more of these dryads gone feral and angry, and it will only be more and more common encounter as industry and progress eat up more and more of their natural homelands. Yeah. So, <clears throat> And he finishes with your fellow stumbler in the dark, Joshua. Not going to say his last name. Yeah. But I think the whole dryad gone feral or dryad angered is a very interesting theory. Yeah. Um, considering some of the stuff that we got on video today um, and the dual trees. Yeah. I mean, there's all those dual trees and those are associated with certain um, little folk tradition and things like that. Yeah. But also, there are dual trees that have been messed with or partially logged. And there's Dude. there's trees that have been taken down. In fact, I, I, had to, I did point out to Christian hey, something was recently taken away from this area when they did their last mow or their last cleanup. Right. And he pointed out, wow, it looks like they power washed this whole place not even a week or two ago. Yeah, that was kind of strange. And we'd been there a couple times over the past month. Yeah. So if they, and they also removed that pipe, remember? Because there was a pipe there. So there was a, a huge pipe probably relating to the fountain. All this stuff had been cleaned up. There was some stuff that looked like it had been burned or dragged away and disposed of. So that So it kind of makes you wonder if with all the activity that's been going down, maybe something's kind of stirred up and angry about it. Yeah. Because, you know, we'd gone and felt uneasy, but this is the first time that I've gone and sat down there to basically unpack some camera gear and then do an interview and things like that where I felt completely unwelcome. Yeah. Which is kind of weird. So, and, and plus with, in our video, just to kind of give you a tease of what we actually come across with, we came across some minor things like random K2 hits, uh, with the K2 meters going crazy, uh, a high radioactive sort of spike, and just general weirdness. So, yeah. And Pepper. And, but yeah. Pepper, Pepper being Pepper, freaked out. <laughs> uh, she was a little freaked out and was really ready to go. Yeah. Which is strange. At first we thought it was a possibility of a storm, but there was no storm coming. So it was kind of a strange thing. Yeah. So, so at this point, I think what we're going to do is we're going to take a little break on the Creep Geeks podcast and play you some upcoming information about a, an event that's happening uh, on May 11th uh, at the Shop Eclectic in basically Marion, in 49 State Street in Marion. Um, so yeah, so you should uh, you should have a little listen. Hi, this is Bobby from the Asheville Past Lives Project. I'd like to invite you all to a talk I'll be giving on May 11th, 7 p.m. at the Shop Eclectic in Marion, North Carolina. I'll be talking about past life explorations for the 21st century, and we'll do a demonstration of a group past life journey. 
Starts at 7 p.m. It's free and part of the Shop Eclectic monthly lecture program. Thanks to my friends at M&D Investigations and Creep Geeks for the invite. The Shop Eclectic is at 49 State Street in downtown Marion. Come by and say hi. There will be snacks. The goal of m and Paranormal is to compassionately, knowledgeably, and professionally support and offer paranormal services to those who have been affected by a paranormal experience, including those who have been indirectly affected. Services provided include paranormal investigation, property research, and evidence review of residential, business, and private property locations. Cleansing of these properties are available upon request. No matter the circumstances of the paranormal experience, m and Paranormal strive to offer a non-judgmental environment to promote education, open communication, and empathy to each individual that chooses to share their experience or come into our service. In achieving this goal, m and Paranormal is building and bringing together a community of open and like-minded individuals by offering free monthly gatherings and events at the Shop Eclectic, 49 State Street, Marion, North Carolina. Call us anytime at 828-484-1637 or 828-559-2818 or email us at mndparanormal. Okay, so that was the Sasquatch Squad yes. that we played last time, and we figured we'd play it this time, too, because I kind of like that song. So anyway, uh, you're listening to the Creep Geeks Podcast. We just came back. We've been talking about Andrew's Geyser with our Weird Wednesday, right? Mm-hmm. High Strangeness in North Carolina series that we're going to do. So, yeah, that's pretty much a battle I got oh, yeah. for this at this particular time. So, what you can do is you can listen to the podcast and the video, right, will be out very shortly. So, uh, if you're listening to the podcast now, if you check the show notes, you're going to find links to everything that we talk about in the podcast, along with a link to the video. Or, you could just go to our Creek Peaks YouTube channel and you'll find the video there. Or, if you follow us on Facebook, you should be able to see the video uh, there as well, on our Creep Peaks Facebook page or Facebook group, which is just basically called the Creep Geeks Facebook group. How's that? Okay. Yeah. Uh, I do want to mention, since we are doing this weird Wednesday thing, um, 
we are focusing on high strangeness in North Carolina or the Carolinas in general. Yeah. If you do have a tip or a heads up on something that we can go investigate or, you know, just check out, email us. Um, you can do that at contact at creepgeeks.com. Yes. And you can also reach out to us on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter. We're pretty much everywhere. We're yeah. looking for that, that, that lead on something interesting that most people haven't explored. Or maybe we're looking at it from the wrong angle or a different angle. Yeah. If you know anything, certainly by all means, if you'd like to share, please do. You can also call us. We have a phone number. It's 575-208-4025 and leave a message. Mm -hmm. So you can certainly do that. That's kind of our message line. And since we are an offbeat news podcast that takes a lighthearted approach to the strange, the stupid, and the paranormal, and we broadcast out of Western North Carolina, we appreciate those North Carolina tips. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. So... Anyway, there you go. So if you have an opportunity and you're listening to us local and you go down to Andrew's Geyser and you feel a little strange, like you're being watched or unwelcome, I did too. <laughs> How about that? But yeah, leave us a message, man. Let us yeah. know. So, I mean, who knows? Um, but I tell you what, uh, next time we go out and do a more thorough investigation, which there will be in other parts of this, where we go a little off and sort of check things out in great and agonizing detail, we're definitely going to keep you updated with what we find, yeah. if anything at all. So, but that's about it. Okay. So, um, if it's your birthday today, happy birthday. You like that? <laughs> I seen that on a YouTube video. The guy was like, if it's your birthday, and I was like, oh, that's very nice. But it, anyway, that's about it for me. Okay. So, what about you? Um. All right, let's go. All right. Okay. So anyway, see you later. Take it easy. Bye, sickle. Bye.